Hello, my name is Barry Boulier and I'm still an idiot. We're going to talk about T1 testing pinouts and loop back as I promised in the first video or installment that I did. And I'm going to jump right in and talk about uh, the modular T1 pinout since that's the most popular one uh, today. I already talked about the DB15 and ModTap changers for T1. Uh, today we're going to talk about loopbacks and uh, reversals. And in the early days of, of T1, when the modular transport started becoming a thing and patching, and a lot of T1 can be patched on 568B patch panels as well. Now, the one thing that I want to talk about, or at least remind people of, because they tend to forget, is uh, early T1 specification was for a type of uh, solid belfoil shield drip wire two pair cable called uh, ABAM, A B A M. And it has been manufactured in about 15, 20 years. But in the early days of T1 that I was a part of uh, in, in the Bell, Bell companies and, and at Western Union, which actually did it about the same time as the Bell, Bell companies, that's what we used because uh, uh, interference on T1 uh, was, was quite common in a central office. So they used this ABAM cable, which isn't available anymore. That's okay. T1 really does work on, uh, on a bob wire transport. You would think that in today's Cat3, Cat5, Giggy transport and, and customer distribution systems, it wouldn't be a problem. It is. You can get away with using a patch cord, a uh, relatively short one, hopefully, uh, Ethernet patch cord for patching T1 circuits around. Um, if you're using it for long distance, it's highly recommended not to. The extra twists in the pinouts of, the, uh, of Ethernet cabling can affect T1 signaling over the long run. Um, if you're going to be doing a lot of signaling in your customer prem or if you're building a, a data center, and hopefully some people know this, uh, avoid possible problems and just run straight old 25 pair cable uh, since you can't get the ABAM anymore. Uh, and if you can, split out the 25 pair cable to a send cable and a receive cable. Um, using uh, uh, individual runs of Cat3 and Cat5 Cat5 especially over the long haul can cause problems. Cat3 if you have to, um, but it's still not recommended for the long haul. Um, so I mentioned in the other video that T1 pins out on 1, 2, 4, and 5, which 8 used to be in the old days ground, which has been used since the AVAM cable was discontinued. That's where the drip wire would go. Um, and flat satin is the popular medium. Of, of T1. This is an example. Let me show you this. This is a T1 reversal. I used to make these myself until I found you could buy them. I don't even remember where I got this or who the manufacturer is, but it's got a part number on it. And it's a nice crimp on the, on the jack side and the plug side as well. And you notice it's made out of flat satin. It's not made out of round cable. Now you can use round cable and that's okay. Um, one of the things I want to talk about real quick too before I forget, and I mentioned it in the other video, and that is using the right type of crimp. And I talked about how you can see the difference between a, uh, a solid core crimp and a uh, stranded uh, wire crimp. And also there's flat and round connectors as well. So there's like four types of connectors you need to be aware of. Um, there, it's really hard to see, so what I've done is I've actually marked my bags. Uh, this one here says round solid. Okay, I'm not kidding about this stuff. Um, so if you're making up any type of T1 stuff, especially if you're making loopback devices and crimps, and you want to put a loopback on the end of something for a telco to test, especially if they're going to do, if they're looking for slow bit errors uh, that will eventually reset the interfaces uh, or possibly cause uh, intermittent bipolar violations. Anything that's inductive of a bad connection, this could be your root cause. You might think you have a, a good uh, loopback plug because when in doubt, ohm it out. Or you might have just tested it real quick with uh, an SLT or, or some other type of test medium device. That doesn't mean it's good. You really need to have a good bit error tester. This is my own T1 tester. So not everybody has one. I do. Um, so these are round cables, and the video won't show it, but down inside here, it's curved. 
and that accommodates a round cable. And it's solid, which means the, the little tang connectors, there's just two. So when you actually crimp, that's the little copper guy. When you crimp uh, the solid connector, um, my, let me back up, there's three. Solid is three. Solid will do uh, an insulation displacement as it goes through the wire like this. And if, you, and if I look carefully, I can actually see that there's like three little tangs in there. That's round solid. Um, I've got flat stranded. Now this is what you would use for uh, the silver satin eight wire cable. Uh, and it says flat stranded. Okay, And, and the crimps are different. Uh, you may think this is kind of anal, but when we're making these type of <clears throat> we're making our own patch cords or cables or loop back plugs. These things are actually very, very important. And it's a square uh, inside to accommodate the flat cable. And uh, for stranded, I can see it's only two little crimps. So when it, it splays out the stranded wire, when you crimp into it with the crimp tool. Yeah, I have my own crimp tools as well. I This is a multi-chuck uh, amp tool. I, I recommend buying the good stuff. Uh, the amps are better than some of the other ones out there and only the fact that it's protected by an overall shell. Um, I had a, a different one for a long time and I dropped it and it kind of bent this a little bit and then the chucks just didn't fit in any, anymore. The chucks were great because they snapped in where the amp, you've got a little set screw to hold it in. Uh, but I've got various dies uh, for the amp tool. And eventually I just bought another and kept my six pin in it. It was just easier that way. So when you're crimping your cables, make sure you use the right connector. Um, go to your distributor um, and make sure you get the right one. If you buy it at the latest box stores who carry a fair amount of uh, networking gear and support hardware nowadays, be careful. They may or may not have designated it solid or stranded or round or flat connectors. Uh, and they're relatively cheap, okay? Uh, but get the right ones. So T1 pins out 1, 2, 4, and 5. Send, receive. And, and I won't get into what you send and which is the receive pair. There is a standard. You can Google it. I'm talking about the physical layer here today, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on. One of the things I like is um, this little breakout wheel. And... It's really worth your while to have this breakout wheel. It has the various pinouts on it for USOC, 568B, etc. And it's clearly marked what the numbers are. And you can also use it as an inline uh, adapter. It's got a, a, a Gazetta and a Gazetta. Um, this one actually works. One of the things that I have found over the years is that couplers don't always work. Um, I have an, uh, an example of a bad one. I, I was doing some T1 installs at, here in Colorado years and years and years ago for Oracle. And um, I didn't have a cable that was quite long enough. And just for the, the, the purpose of, of testing and, and bringing up some cards on the switch, um, I used one of these couplers, 8-pin couplers, and looped back the far end, and I was getting all kinds of bit errors. And I went through a couple of couplers, and I'm thinking, okay, the cable's bad, the crimp's bad, the card's bad, something's bad, because I was checking my whole plant. Um, I was telling a friend of mine just yesterday that check at the end of the cable. We normally do a loop back um, with T1 with our little plugs we make, right, our little loop backs, pinning out, you know, looping back one, two, four, and five. Um, and so you put it in at the device, the patch panel, whatever. You loop it back to your equipment, and it's good. Not always do we check all the way back, all the cables, all the connectors with a female biscuit block or a loop back uh, coupler like this where you can loop back the end of the cable, right? Uh, and it turned out this darn little coupler was bad. For some reason, and I haven't taken one apart, I, I just threw them all away except for this one, um, it induces bipolar violations. I have another type that does not, or kill two birds with one stone and get your handy dandy breakout wheel. Uh, these aren't very expensive at all and definitely, definitely worth it. Okay. So what I've done on here is actually done the same thing as the plug as I've looped back one, two, four, and five, one to, one to four, two to five, 
and that gives me my T1 send receive loopbacks. Uh, and it's very important to to check all your connections. So on my on my tester here, I'm going to uh, plug in my tester to the loopback, and this is the same thing a, a field tech would do, or even somebody in a central office. And um, it's flashing some errors. I'm going to resync it. No errors. And the measurement shows bipolar violations, bit errors, and, and some other uh, other things. But to check my loop back, I'm going to inject an error. I should get an error back. And you probably can't see it on the LCD, but there's one BPV and one bit error. Two, three. As I inject it, I get it back. This is a great loop back. And if you suspect you've got something intermittent, um, your hosting site will probably have something more along the lines of a T-Bird or something like that. Uh, I don't have a, a T-Bird. It's incredibly expensive. This this alone was about seven grand. Um, T-Birds are a lot more than that. But it does the same thing. It can do drop and insert. It's got a, a, an NIU. It can loop back network interface units by the phone company, loop back CSUs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if you're doing a long-term bid error test, this is what you'd use. Now, one of the things that's important to do, too, is... I. In the central office, we called it a bash test, and a lot of people kind of freak out when I do this, including my wife. When I do something at home, uh, I kind of do a mad scientist thing here occasionally. I actually jerk on stuff. You know, I pull on it, and, and I hit it with things. I want to see errors. And, and look, I did. Just by doing that, I have some errors. Go figure. So if you think your cabling plan is suspect, um, use a, using a tester like this, because you won't see it with a voltmeter, whether it's a digital or analog, it'll be too quick. But go in and well, we call it a bash test because we bash all the soldered connections in our central office, injecting frequencies, looking for noise inducted by tapping on connectors. You can do the same thing on your patch panels and your distribution plant by tapping on all the connectors, tapping on this. Now you think, well, that's not going to happen in the real world. You know, on a patch panel, nobody's going to be tapping on it. Wrong. Uh, there, the patch panel and the cables that are all connected will eventually be traced out. Somebody's going to be coming along to your patch panel, and they're going to be tracing out a cable. What do you think they're doing, huh? Yeah. Modular connections are one of the, the worst long-term stable uh, connectors of our kind. Um, tabs break off. Um, it's, it's actually just pressure on these little guys. There is a lifespan of inserts and connects. Believe it or not, um, cheap patch panels uh, and cheap plugs and jacks, um, they, they're, they're not uh, well built. If you Some of the ones overseas that are a lot cheaper, um, the, the coating is not as great for the, the gold, brass, uh, copper plating. Um, the industrial strength of the tangs may not be up to par. I've seen tangs break, tangs bend, tangs come out of their the little slots. If you ever notice on a on a plug on a jack, there's little grooves that these things actually move in and out of, and I've seen them bend and move out. Um, they're loose. I mean, this is just not a great medium for long-term stuff. So, um, if you need to make a loopback plug, you can use a biscuit block and a uh, a jack, and you can make your own. You can always get just a regular biscuit block at any of your buck stores or Annixter Gray Bar. Uh, make sure it's an 8-pin. If you don't know the pin out, you can always Google it. Or, when in doubt, ohm it out. And if you have the breakout wheel I showed you earlier, it just makes your job a lot easier. So remember, T1 is 1, 2, 4, and 5. 8 used to be a drip wire, not used anymore since ABAM's not made. Um, be careful of couplers. Bad couplers, good couplers. Don't trust them all. Um, the pinouts for the DB15 of the mod taps for T1, um, you can make your own or you can look up on uh, the internet what pinouts you need. Uh, you can see that this is uh, one, two, one and three, and it goes over. I have to count it out. I forget. I used to have this stuff memorized. But uh, you can see in this case here, there's only four wires. That's one, two, four, and five on the, the DB sub D. And it's one, two, four, and five of the modular. But that's where it breaks out in the sub D. 
So the modular side, one, two, four, and five, breaks out here on these pins. Um, there's not a lot of this stuff left anymore. Most T1 devices nowadays um, are all modular connected. And recap that be careful of Cat3 and Cat5 for long runs of your T1. They can induce problems. And everything in the cable world is cumulative. Every connection degrades the signal strength. Every connection is a weak point. So um, avoid couplers and splices uh, and anything else where you can. Uh, couplers should only be used short term. Um, a lot of us in the past have used Amphenol couplers, another one. If you've got multiple 25 pair cables and they're not long enough and you're using Amphenols to extend them, two Amphenol cables, well, you've got a connection at that end, a connection at this end, a connection at this end, and a connection at the far end into the patch panel. It all degrades the signal. T1 works very, very, very far where Ethernet's right around 300 meters, but it's all cumulative. And noise can be inducted by anything. Uh, Ethernet susceptible to like fluorescent lights and three-phase conduits. So is T1. Everything is cumulative. So when testing for T1, um, CSUs, DSUs are becoming a thing of the past. They're more internal now. Um, they do have loopback capabilities. Um, AIS and the various signaling that you get showing far end and near end errors that you can all Google that. I don't need to go into it here. The terminology is pretty much the same, although some people do use terms wrong. Uh, blue alarms, yellow alarms. Yellow usually means AIS, but it could mean other things for other companies, too. It really depends on the manufacturers. Be careful with your T1. Uh, unlike Ethernet, that, uh, that usually runs TCP IP, where things are resent, T1 is not. T1 gets an error, it's an error. If you're doing voice over T1, whether it's a channel bank, channelized into a router access unit, um, anything of this nature, if you've got a bad connection, like you're tracing out that cable into a crummy patch panel, and it's a loose connection, and that T1 starts chopping up bit errors, it might not fail the T1 in its entirety, but those bit errors, those small little errors, will translate to choppy voice, and people will recognize that, maybe. In today's world, cell phones and VoIP, choppy voice is less than perfect quality is, is kind of what we expect, but anyway, I'm some idiot, still named Barry Bollier, signing off.